nuclear waste simply tossed into the water. This was the face of waste disposal for decades. Greenpeace activists tried to prevent this in vain. So what's the story behind all this dangerous radioactive waste in the sea? We have been conducting research for a year now in an attempt to find out what became of the barrels of nuclear waste. We also discovered pipes through which the nuclear waste is pumped into the sea. We visited fish markets, met experts. as well as a lot of people who are scared about radiation. We asked politicians about the legacy of the nuclear industry, what's actually going on down there at the bottom of the sea. And because the answers turned out to be unsatisfactory, we went looking for the barrels of nuclear waste ourselves. We are going to get to the bottom of what happened in the past. We want to know where is it radioactive and what is the source of radiation off the coasts of Europe? Anything radioactive was dumped in those steel barrels. Contents, low-level radioactive waste from hospitals, but also radioactive waste from nuclear plants across Europe. For decades, the nuclear industry has used the sea as a dump site. May 1967, in the port of Emden, Lower Saxony, nuclear waste from Germany, Britain and France will be loaded onto the British cargo ship Topaz. The barrels are to be dumped in at least 4,000 meters of water. The nuclear waste was supposed to be diluted by the water. This is considered to be an absolute certainty. The British crew of the Topaz dumps the radioactive load into the sea. More than 100,000 tons of nuclear waste disappear into the North Atlantic, the Irish Sea, but also into the shallow waters of the English Channel. Then in the mid-1970s, Greenpeace stages various actions and raises awareness about these dumping activities. An outcry resounds across Europe. Thirty-two years after the boat operations in the Atlantic, we meet two of the activists from that time at the Greenpeace offices in Hamburg. Harold Zindler and Roland Hipp haven't seen one another for a long time. Both fought with great conviction and commitment against the dumping. We show Harold Zindler the video footage. Even today, years later, a chill runs down his spine. This is cynical. But the nuclear industry was unmoved by the Greenpeace actions. The dumping continued. Environmentalists were criminalized and attacked. Then we were taken captive on the ship and were locked up in the bow. The dumping continued and we could hear it and what we had just witnessed actually happened. A dinghy was hit again and at that point the action was called off. It was far too dangerous and people could have been injured or even killed.
These events took place more than three decades ago. What has happened to the nuclear waste down there on the ocean floor since then? Who knows anything more about it? Come in. Thank you. We meet with a nuclear physicist, John Large, in London. He was involved in the development of a British atomic bomb in the 1960s and knows a lot about the dumping, particularly by the military. Large owns an extraordinary souvenir, a non-radioactive fuel rod from the Sellafield nuclear facility. Fuel rods of this kind were sunk deep in the ground. Large tells us something surprising. The men on the ship were being exposed to radioactivity while they were on the ship, so the ship was making its way to its dump site. Those men were like ticking clocks. The longer they stayed near the waste bed. So it was, it was on the captain to actually reach his allocated dump site within a certain time. If the ship ran into weather difficulties or was making a bad headway, it was slow, the captain was not concerned necessarily about where to dump the waste, but the time that the crew were being, and himself were being exposed to radioactivity. So when the clock ran out, that's when they dumped. So there can be no assurance that the radioactive waste was dumped where the civil servants said it was dumped. So how can these barrels ever be located for, say, control purposes? A look at official British dumping inventories raises even more doubt about the accuracy of the information. Entries relating to coordinates or ocean depths are often marked not known. It gets worse. Even when it comes to information regarding radioactivity, we repeatedly read, not known, not known, not known. This is according to an inventory of dumpings in the Irish Sea. Who could possibly know where the barrels are located? Perhaps the UK Health Protection Agency, HPA, might be able to help, as it is responsible for radioactive waste. We meet Dr. John Cooper, departmental head of the Center for Radiation, Chemical and Environmental Hazards. He knows all about the problem of dumped nuclear waste barrels. Can it really be that the dumping inventories are incorrect? I would be surprised if there were other disposals which, um, which were not included, but of course you cannot completely yeah. exclude that. The military did never tell you what they dump. So what do you do with this fact? Um, well, I think at some point you have to rely on the information you've got. The UK nuclear reprocessing site Sellafield, formerly Windscale. The atomic waste also came from here and disappeared into the Irish Sea, into the Channel, into the Atlantic. The suspicion? Highly radioactive nuclear waste may have been dumped. It was officially banned. If you look at the inventories, the analysis of materials that have been recovered from the seabed that have only come from dumping, not atmospheric testing from dumping, there's no doubt in my mind that high level waste has been physically dumped at sea. That would mean that the inventories are incorrect in this particular. How could such errors occur? Are they actually errors at all, or was it intentional? With the powers uh, that are written in a future... Michael Meacher might know more about this. He was Minister of State for the Environment from 1997 to 2003 and an opponent of the dumping policy. Charging uh, for workplace parking levies uh, and other measures which local authorities will put into their local... Today, the former senior minister in Tony Blair's cabinet is an ordinary backbencher. We show him the inventories. Who made false statements? Who knew anything about the dumpings? I'd be very glad to have a bottle here, and it's often likely to be a minor. The Commission will give guidance and advice to ensure. I suspect that that was uh, an, an agreement between the Ministry of Defence, the Army, 
and the nuclear industry. I presume um, this was, uh, uh, I won't say a plot, but this was a, an agreement between them all to do something which they would rather not anyone knew about. Uh, and that's why it's now impossible to get the information about exactly what was dumped, where it was dumped. I think we have a pretty good idea where it was dumped, but we don't know. And the quantity of it, we certainly don't know. And the effects of dumping that in the sea over decades or centuries, again, we don't know. I mean, uh, this, is a, this is a sort of conspiracy. Even Greenpeace didn't know at that time how bad it was, but the protests were successful. The dumping of nuclear waste was forbidden worldwide in 1993. Greenpeace activists were celebrated as heroes, as in the case here in Vigo, Spain. For more than half a century, barrels of nuclear waste had been dumped into the sea in keeping with the motto at the time, the solution of pollution is dilution. The fundamental underlying problem was that they assumed that if you dilute the radioactivity with tons and tons of water, it's safe to discharge. If you dump solid radioactive waste and it dissolves in tons and tons and tons of water, then it's safe to dispose of it in that way. And that is being proved wrong time and time and time again. The first evidence that dangerous, highly toxic waste, which has accumulated over the years, simply doesn't disappear through dilution, was gathered by experts after an exploratory trip in the mid-1980s. Germany sent the research vessel Walter Herwig to the Atlantic dump sites. The disposal points were examined. In so doing, the scientists inadvertently salvaged nine barrels. The researchers found plutonium in the water, in the seabed, and in the fish. Internal papers from the Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, state, increased concentrations of plutonium in the dump sites indicate plutonium leaks from the barrels. So now the toxins have finally arrived in the biosphere. Monaco, seat of the IAEA's marine laboratories. Biologists here are researching the dangers of nuclear waste in the sea. This is the head of the laboratory, Dr. Hartmut Nies. The experts feed contaminated food to marine animals. They want to find out how it will affect the organisms. Dr. Nies and his colleagues are also in charge of the barrels of dumped nuclear waste. The key question is, what happened to the barrels? Are there still any undamaged barrels down there after all these years, or are they all corroded? We examined the ocean floor constantly in any case, and we would certainly have noticed any barrels. So you would assume that the barrels in the English Channel would all have rusted open or have simply gone? I would assume so. And if you would now find undamaged barrels, wouldn't it be better to salvage them? If it's not going to cost me a lot to get them out, of course. Yes, yes. There hasn't been a single new investigation into the dump sites for 12 years. Is Nice right? Are all the barrels corroded? We decide to have a look for ourselves. Her deep, an underwater channel in the channel, close to the Channel Islands, is the only dump site within range of our resources and capabilities. We have charted a boat. Her deep is approximately 10 nautical miles northwest of the Channel Islands, Alderney. 
A small submarine is supposed to provide us with video images. The unit is almost impossible to maneuver because the English Channel is known for its strong currents. The Greenpeace activist Harold Zindler is on board. If I had the resources, I would fetch up a barrel immediately and dump it on the doorstep of those responsible. It is irresponsible. More than 28,000 barrels of nuclear waste have been dumped there. It's unbelievable. Her deep's special attribute, thousands of barrels of nuclear waste are not stored at a depth of 5,000 meters, but are sitting there in a mere 100 meters of water. Tension mounts. According to the inventories, there are munitions from the war down there, as well as nuclear waste. What are we going to find? We filmed a nuclear waste barrel on the first dive, undamaged. So there are sealed barrels still down there which could be salvaged. Of course, we are not permitted to salvage the barrel. On the second dive, we also discover this totally corroded barrel. Up on the boat, the fine leaves Harold Zindler upset. What shocked me most here, we discovered barrels very close to land in 90, 140 meters of water in a place where we can even see Alderney and are looking towards France, which is barely 30 minutes away. We return to Alderney. What does this find mean for the residents of the island? Professor Chris Busby approaching Alderney. The physicist was here decades ago. A doctor had asked him to come. There was an unusually high incidence of cancers on the island. Busby has been actively campaigning against the dangers of nuclear radiation for years now. He is regarded as something of an enfant terrible, stubborn and awkward. Rather than to listen to his pointed opinions, he is the sort of person whom the authorities prefer to stigmatize. Alderney is a peaceful place. Time passes more slowly here than elsewhere. It has a total of 2,400 residents. The island is also a refuge for well-to-do British pensioners. But the place may not be as idyllic as it at first seems. To our surprise, Busby first of all takes us to the cemetery. According to the thesis, you have to look for the victims. That will tell you more than any maximum radiation levels. 35. Where? There. No, for 50. You only need to find one case of childhood leukemia on the whole island, and you've got an answer. You've got, you've got, you've got too many children, childhood leukemias, too many. L-I-A-M. We try to find out whether there really is an increased incidence of cancer deaths. However, the UK government keeps the precise statistics under lock and key. Data protection policy. Perhaps we'll find clues on the island. We take a stab at it and ask in the residential area near the cemetery about causes of death. One of the estate agent's first wives had died from a brain tumour, and then when we came over a few years ago, his second wife has had a brain tumour, but she, she's, I think she's all right now. 
and um, there was actually a series on the television in England about operations where they filmed them live and they filmed um, a chap having a brain tumour removed and he, we found out that he was from Alderney and he in fact died last year. But I think there is a child, there's been a child here, at least one child with a brain tumour. We, we're going back to England. Statistically speaking, this would be very noticeable, but the authorities have only one thing to say to Chris Busby. Everything is fine. Wow. The professor goes with us to the beach. He wants to measure radiation. The competent UK authorities argue that both the quantity and levels of radiation were far too low to cause harm to people. What we have learned since the 1980s is that material that goes into the sea comes back to land. And it does this because the particles um, on the seabed, the very fine particles, attract the radioactivity, attract the plutonium and attract the cesium and all the other stuff. Professor Busby wants to go even further out. Dusk begins to fall and the tide starts to come in. Busby criticizes the authorities because they didn't do any of their own measurements, but simply guesstimated the levels of radioactivity out there in Herd Deep. I would expect to find cesium-137, ruthenium-106, a whole load of stuff. Plutonium. Plutonium? Yeah, for sure. So that might be quite poisonous here. Well, of course. Chris Busby's gamma spectrometer measures increased levels of radiation at this point. 204. But there was a hell of a lot of uranium from the herd, herd deep. They dumped an enormous amount of, of enriched uranium in, in, in the herd deep. That was a very big amount of material there, so it's entirely possible that that also has ended up here. We also take readings with our Geiger counter. It is true, the level of radiation has increased. How dangerous is this for the people here on Alderney? Only requires one cell to be damaged to go on to form another cell and another cell and another cell and eventually form cancer. So every single dose, right down to a single radionuclide decay, has a finite probability of causing cancer. Is Busby on the right track, the outsider? And shouldn't the undamaged barrels be salvaged as a precaution? What does the director at the HPA, Dr. John Cooper, have to say? I don't think there was a, a great risk, from the, a significant risk from the, dispo, from the disposals at Herd Deep. Even if it is only 100 metres? Yeah, it's probably something you wouldn't do these days. I think the, rate, the best way of approaching this is to leave the material where it is. We chase up the Atomic Energy Agency, competent in these matters. How does the agency evaluate the dangers of these dumped barrels? We have seen that the sea's capacity for dilution is so vast. We have seen in the discharges from Sellafield and La Arc, which have drifted with the currents over many years, that if this water were not seawater, then it would be suitable as drinking water. However, there are differing opinions about this. Professor Klaus Gruppen has published textbooks on radiation protection. So, what about dilution in seawater to levels that would meet the standards required of drinking water? And is everything really hunky-dory? If the amount in which it is diluted is infinitely vast, if I discharge it into outer space, then it might be well diluted. But the Earth is a very small celestial body, and the concentration is constantly growing. Our conclusion. The radioactivity is only spreading out instead of disappearing altogether through dilution. There are no exact details about the location and number of barrels, and there is disagreement as to whether they should be salvaged.
The dumping of nuclear waste in the sea was banned worldwide in 1993, yet the nuclear industry has come up with other ways. They no longer dump the barrels at sea. They built kilometers of underwater pipes through which the radioactive effluent now flows freely into the sea. One of these pipes is situated in Normandy. It comes from the French reprocessing plant at La Hague. Greenpeace protested here too, underwater. To environmentalists, the matter is clear cut. This method of disposal through pipes destroys the environment just like the dumping of barrels. The advantage for the nuclear industry, no more bad press because of the barrels. For the disposal via waste pipes remains hidden from the public eye, quite literally. Log is the waste processing plant servicing nuclear waste from all over Europe. Germany's casters rolling into Normandy. But the people here are no longer willing to accept the abuse of the sea as a nuclear dustbin. David Boyer is a physicist, founder, and chairman of an environmental group. He is visiting a local primary school today and telling the children about radioactivity, toxic plutonium, and nuclear waste. David Boyer asks us to come with him to the fish market. The physicists criticized the assessment criteria relating the health of marine organisms. According to him, Fukushima has changed things. We need to rethink. One can no longer say clean water equals clean fish equals healthy fish. Some of them contaminated and some of them not. It's more difficult with fish because they move around. So one fish picked up some place, might have been in a radioactive place, get contaminated. So in these mussels, you might find something. So what could be found in this mussel? Some? some of the radioactive elements uh, discharged by the reprocessing plant, like iodine cobalt. So and it's more like gambling, huh? like you might be lucky or unlucky. The toxic waste from the reprocessing plant at La Hague is no longer just local problem for the people of Normandy. According to Boyer, marine pollution is a European problem. If you balance the benefit against the detriment, this benefit is almost zero, except for the local economy. But as a global point of view, it's zero. And the detriment is evident, so of course it is a sin. Boyer travels with us to Ostend, Belgium, 400 kilometers from La Hague. He will show us how far the radioactive toxins have already spread, for their origin has been precisely measured. He meets up with a Belgian activist. He gathers seaweed. The environmental activists distrust the measurements made by the operators. Boyer travels with us to Holland. He wants to collect seaweed samples for his lab here as well. I have the iodine, the seaweeds from Germany there. We collect, this was sent to Acro by a German friend of us who was worrying all. Is there iodine contamination from La Hague up to Germany? And the answer is yes. We find iodine in the seaweed up to Germany. We are back in Acro's labs, the Citizens Initiative. 
The water that was just brought here by volunteers has given a five-fold higher tritium value than the rating supplied by the French operator Arriva. It is now obvious why the citizens take their own measurements. David Boyer has brought some marine animals from the market. Pierre Babet, a molecular biologist, tells us what happened to the animals. We now know that there is a very good exchange between the deep sea and the upper water layers. The radioactive toxins accumulate in the food chain. This little worm here, for example, can contain two to three thousand times more radioactivity than its environment. It is then eaten by the next biggest creature and so on. At the end of the food chain, we discovered damage to the reproductive cells of crabs. And this damage, these genetic defects, are inherited from one generation to the next. And the effects and the mechanism of human cells and animal cells are the same. Yes, yes. I don't know a cell is a cell in human or in animal, it's the same. Highly toxic plutonium is found in grey seals off the coasts of Europe. Radioactive cesium has been found in porpoises. The animal impact upon future generations is unknown, so marine biologists insist every animal must be protected from radioactivity. But how dangerous is the nuclear waste in the sea for us humans? We look for answers to this question in the UK, in Sellafield. There have been some alarming reports from there. The second disposal pipe for Europe's nuclear waste is located in the north of England. As in France, it was Greenpeace environmental activists who drew attention to the pipe. That was in 1997. Also present, the then 35-year-old Sean Burney. And the electricity. For nearly two decades, Burney has been actively campaigning against the discharges. It is a struggle for numbers, limits, but also the prerogative of interpretation. Burney is concerned about the people here on the coast. The government has had many of them examined. You see here, along this coast, there are people living uh, on this beach. You can see these small houses. And they are uh, what's considered the, one of the critical groups because they live right on the beach. They're exposed every day uh, to the sea and therefore to radiation coming in from the sea. Uh, so their houses are full of plutonium dust. Uh, their bodies will be more radioactive, they'll have plutonium in their teeth. The closer you are to Sellafield in the UK, the more plutonium you have in your teeth. The pipe from Sellafield is clearly visible only from the air. But how could the disposal contractor bypass the ban on discharges? Nuclear waste is still being dumped in the sea. The operators argue this is land-based disposal and therefore legal. It has been approved by the authorities. Is there a scientific, logical reason why barrels are prohibited and discharges are allowed? I think it is more a philosophical question. This is not a philosophical question for him. Wolfgang Rinneberg was director for nuclear safety at the German Federal Ministry of the Environment and is an expert in the disposal of radioactive waste. No, there is no logical reason for it. Ultimately, there are only economic reasons. 
The question is, how expensive would it be to install appropriate filtration systems, for example, that would ensure that a discharge of this kind is close to zero? Perhaps this plant would prove to be uneconomical. That's what's behind it. There is no evidence of a physical reason or any other reasons for that matter. Every day more radioactive swill flows into the Irish Sea. Nuclear waste from Sellafield can now be found on the Norwegian coast. In the meantime, the local residents are given to believe all is under control here on the beaches around Sellafield. The staff at Sellafield make their presence felt. The operators and authorities both claim there is no risk. Checks and controls are being carried out all the time. And yet, plutonium can be found here on a daily basis. The toxic waste returns from the sea here as well. It leaches out, it dries, and is left lying on the beach. The people here have long since guessed that the dangers are greater than those responsible care to admit. We're not going to change the world. The little people don't do it. It's the big people that do that. So I've never heard any frightening tales. Could be, it could be kept quiet. It could be under the carpet. It might not be. But until I know, you know, there's, there's the, the sea's been polluted all over the world. The beach at Sellafield has won an award for being one of the cleanest in England. Every day, a groundhog or a small excavator removes plutonium from the beach. A scanner locates small radioactive particles at a depth of 30 centimeters. In recent decades, the operator at Sellafield has tossed more than 500 kilograms of plutonium into the sea. the Netherlands, Janine Alice Smith, lived inland from Sellafield for many decades. She is positive that the British authorities are playing down the problem of radioactivity. And she is also convinced that years ago, plutonium from Sellafield caused her young son's illness, leukemia. So the reason I became, we used to go to the beach and we used to spend lots of time on the beach. And like all babies, he picked up sand, he put it over his head, he put it in his mouth. And at the age of 12, he got leukemia. And I then realized that he was not the only one. There were more children in the area. Donald, Donald he, he did okay. He was diagnosed as a little child, but at the age of 19, he was afraid that it would come back. And Gemma, she died at the age of um, seven. She had to have a bone marrow transplant, but she died of infection. Windscale, the biggest commercial nuclear reprocessing works in the world. As early as the 1980s, regional television had already reported of the increased incidence of leukemia in children. For journalists, it was obvious that the operator and even the health authorities were in denial about the true extent of the danger. As many as three pupils at the same primary school in C-scale developed leukemia. Despite Yorkshire Television's intense coverage of the issue, the discharges continued. In the world. The radioactivity here can be measured quite simply with a Geiger counter. It's in the mud and it's on the beach. Scientist Dr. Philip Day is measuring this radioactive pollution. We tried to find out if there was any truth in these reports. It is strictly forbidden to film around the reprocessing plant at Sellafield, nor is it possible to take photographs on site, nor can we get near to the discharge pipe. It proves difficult to arrange an interview. As a last resort, we finally meet in the car park in front of the plant. 
What is the link between the radioactive waste and the leukemia cases? Obviously, the leukemia issue is a difficult one. Um, it's been investigated for years by the UK medical authorities, who are the right people to investigate that sort of issue. And their conclusions are that the leukemia excesses around Sellafield, um, in one particular locality, cannot be due to our operations. On the basis of that reasoning, the beach remains open in spite of the plutonium fines. It has been long since assumed within the scientific community that chronic poisoning, even low radiation doses, can trigger cancer. We drove 10 kilometers inland because it is also possible to find the toxic deposits here. The level of radiation has increased on this riverbank. Janine Alice Smith and Sean Burney show us. It's, it's going up slightly. It's going up to about 30. So that is three times nearly what we found um, sort of lower on the, on the road when we started. And this is a spot which is freely accessible to the public. A bridle path leads along the riverbank. Bernie and Alice Smith are critical of the authorities. They believe that they are being deliberately imprecise about their work. So when the authorities take a sample and they measure, they might take one sample here. What I used to say to journalists, oh. they just want to know what happens from year to year. They don't want to know what happens 50 years ago. And, you know, they try and hide that, but it's there. So you don't take deep samples. They don't take deep samples. They take surface. Very few samples are taken. Uh, so they get the they get the evidence that they're looking for rather than what is would be in the interests of public health. The authorities haven't even measured plutonium at this spot. We take a soil sample and we'll have it evaluated back in Germany at the University of Mainz. The result turns out to be alarming. The amount of plutonium is up to 10 times higher than the permissible limit. Okay, that's the first sample. The other sample will come from far more. How dangerous is it to live in Sellafield? Professor Richard Wakeford from the University of Manchester doesn't think it's that dangerous. The operators like to quote him. After having worked for almost 30 years in the nuclear industry, he is considered to be one of the luminaries on the subject of radiation risks. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, I think that's, we go into the coal all the better. We prepared the chair. I assess the risks of, from radiation uh, in, a, in an aircraft flight or living in or living in Seascale to be very small, and it should really not be of major concern to, to, to parents or anyone else. There are much more important things to be worried about. There are two major ideas. Either childhood leukemia is a rare response to a common but as yet unidentified infection, or large-scale urban rural. Uh, population mixing, there has been an increase of childhood leukemia. I mean, that's very compelling epidemiological evidence. Well, Conclusion. Either a virus or population mixing around Sellafield is responsible for cancer, but not the highly toxic nuclear waste from the sea? Uh, I mean, there, there was... Um... We are confused and ask a German expert, the physician Klaus Hoffmann, a member of the various German federal government's radiation protection committees, we meet the busy scientist in a Bonn hotel. What do you say when UK experts stand there and proclaim that these connections don't exist? Well, they are simply wrong. There is little evidence for the population mixing hypothesis, and there is absolutely no evidence of the virus hypothesis. There is neither a virus, nor are there antibodies. In other words, forget this whole infection hypothesis. These hypotheses that have arisen primarily to explain away any risk from radiation. It is no longer possible to explain away radiological risks contained in internal, 
IAEA documents. Here we read of the advantages, low energy costs, jobs. But there is also a record here of the very things Professor Wakeford is refuting. Radiation is indeed responsible for shorter life expectancy and premature death. Cancer is also named as the cause. Leukemia, bone cancer, thyroid cancer, lung cancer. Here are private videos from a children's cancer ward in Wales. Professor Chris Busby sent them to us. In recent decades, doctors have been registering a steady increase in childhood leukemia here. For the little ones, the treatment is torture. Everyone is convinced that the leukemia comes from Sellafield. Chris Busby asked us to visit him again. Together with his colleague, Richard Bramhall, Busby tells us an incredible story. The cancer statistics around Sellafield are 10 times higher than in the rest of the country. If they're alive. Or else you have to find somebody. They will do anything to cover up the truth. We were leaked that uh, data, the database from the Wales Cancer Registry. Someone had a bad conscience. Eventually, the Wales Cancer Registry people said, oh, well, we'll give you the data, but not down to the small areas, but down to, like, the county district areas, which is much bigger. But when the data came, and I put it on the computer, I found that it was the small area data. It wasn't the big. So whoever had done it, either by mistake, or well, because they wanted to leak it, had given us the small area data. After the cancer registry had given us the data, they were sacked. That was it. I put a, le I put a, a letter into the, the British... The people were sacked? Yeah, all of them, yeah. yeah. Well, they yeah. closed the unit down. Yeah. We don't know what happened. So this woman, Mary Cotter, who said, we will give you what you want, she was sacked. Recently, the House of Lords refused to publish current pediatric cancer numbers, data protection policy. And the nuclear industry? It strikes a balance between cancer rates and costs. The effort required to protect people from radiation exposure should also take stock of the cost implications. We want to find out from the UK health authorities, can it really be true? To reduce the doses any further might cost a disproportionate amount of money that could be actually spent elsewhere. So that's the sort of balancing you have to do. Is that supposed to mean that you are prepared to accept a number of cancer deaths to keep the costs of discharging atomic waste into the sea as low as possible? You are doing that comparison. Uh, I'm reading that. Mm -hmm. And that's no different to what happens in many other areas of decision making in society. Where do such cost-benefit considerations come from? In our research, we come across the influential ICRP, the International Commission on Radiation Protection. The group operates as an independent charity for the benefit of the public. A request for an interview with the director is refused. But we find a lecture on the internet by the former chairman, Roger Clark. Society's changed. If you went he elucidates the cost-benefit principle. Clark cites Epicurus' um, utility ethic. Some examples of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right? Everybody the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. ...was a good thing. So you vaccinated everybody. The Insiders tell us that the ICRP is the elongated the arm of the nuclear industry. We also come across Professor Wakeford's name on the website the expert from the University of Manchester. To our surprise, we also find Dr. John Cooper's name from Health Protection Agency. You are working for the Health Protection Agency. Yes. At the same time, you are in the main body of the ICRP. Yes. So you give yourself the independent scientific yes. risk from one hand to the other. So, yeah. in Germany, it would be a conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah, a conflict, uh, of, interest. Uh, a conflict of interest. Yes, I, I, that is a problem. The HPA is the ICRP. The ICRP is made up of government institutions, government representatives. 
So therefore, the HPA, the ICRP, is made up of government representatives. It's not some... The ICRP is not some great independent body. It's made up. People from the HPA attend meetings of the ICRP and set the standards. Even former UK Environment Minister Meacher has to admit his impotence. I, as a minister, and uh, my civil servants were not very pleased about this, bringing in people like Chris Busby or other people who are independent scientists like John Large. I mean, they didn't want that kind of uh, confrontation or discussion or debate. I mean, if we, would, if we had that kind of open, honest exercise, one would feel a lot more confident. But government doesn't want to do this. They just want to go with the official standard view, which actually is the nuclear industry view. And at the coalface, for years now, Sean Burney and Janine Alice Smith have endured much frustration. No one talks openly. The environmental activist and the mother of a son with leukemia are fighting a quixotic fight. I think, in a way, it's a quite a sad place. It used to be a really thriving holiday place. People used to come from all over with trains from all parts of Cumbria. Anger that uh, decisions by governments over many decades have created this nuclear disaster on this coastline. And uh, for most people here, they don't know about it, or if they do know about it, they don't want to know about it. Uh, it's out with their control. It's a decision made by government in London. Sellafield and La Hague show that the disposal of waste into the sea was, and still is, a mistake. However, hardly anyone is prepared to admit it officially, because then you would have to deal with tough questions. Who was lying? What can still be salvaged? And who is going to pay for it? From the Northeast Atlantic dump sites all the way up to the coast of Norway, nuclear contamination from barrels and pipes is a problem which is deliberately being brushed under the carpet. This can only be resolved by sealing off the pipes and salvaging the undamaged barrels wherever possible. <laughs>